Thanks. I'm again between you and the lunch, and I hope I will make it in time. You know, I always hated the talks where people talk about a lot about everything, but um, I wanted to learn about one thing, but now I do the thing myself. I kind of have many little things here, although I try to concentrate on the heat-based measurement of qubits and, and the on-demand dissipation for qubits, but I have I have a little bit of other stuff as well, which I think um, the latest stuff which you might find interesting. So, and um, I, for those who don't know my group, I just wanted to show the photo of the lab that yes, we are also doing experiments. It's uh, just an orientation for you. And, uh, and of course, I'd like to thank my research group. This is a group photo from last summer. And I'd like to thank the founder, funders. We had a quantum computer project that is now ended. Uh, and then we are also funded by the ERC. Uh, by the way, thank you. There must be some people in the audience who were referees of the ERC advance grant that was just granted to, to our group. And so thank you for that. And we're looking for postdocs. There's a call open. So if you know good experimental people on superconducting qubits, please uh, let, them, let them send applications to us. Um, we also, about three years ago, we span out a company from my research group, IQM. And that company is now already a uh, significant size. Uh, so part of this work is done in collaboration with some of the nice guys working at IQM as well. Um, but that's not all, of course. The this is the quantum computer working group. Uh, that, was, uh, that is now the late quantum computer working group. And I'd like to thank also these people, especially, of course, Jukka is the head of our center of excellence, for example. And we worked a lot with Jukka. And, and then I'd like to thank also Perti, who is in the audience. And, and Tapio, we worked a lot. And of course, there are a lot of international collaborators, like Joachim and, and, and Fabian. And I think Gianluigi is in, in, in online and others. So th thanks for your input to this research. And we're really excited now about this Institute Q, that is the National Finnish Quantum Institute, where a lot of universities join and we join forces. By the way, um, I forgot to say that uh, I'm a professor at Aalto University and VTT, so there are also VTT groups who have collaborated a lot with us, and uh, especially, all, actually, all the work I'm going to talk about is done in collaboration with VTT as well. So um, we uh, came up uh, recently uh, with a new superconducting qubit that we call the Uniman. I'm going to say a few words about that. Um, and then in the ERC advanced grant, the idea is to basically use the Uniman, uh, improve it, and then also uh, to do accurate control, readout, and reset of the Uniman circuits. And um, for control, we recently uh, built up demonstrator micro, uh, millikelvin microwave source. Um, and I'm going to say a few words about that soon. Uh, for readout, we have the world's most sensitive barometers demonstrated, and that, that I'm going to talk about. We use one of our multi-channel driving schemes then in the end to do a very fast readout based on barometers. And, and then for reset, we have the quantum circuit refrigerator. So I'm going to mostly talk about the readout and the reset part. I'm going to say a few words about the Unimon and, and the control. So, but in the end, the idea is to combine combine these with the Unimon circuits, like I said, to make this sort of scalable sort of demonstration. Demonstration of scalable qubit, very accurate qubit uh, type uh, in superconducting platform. So, oh, yeah, the Unimon has been done in, in collaboration with IQM, so we have, this is one part where we could, could collaborate together. And um, you can see, uh, this is the artistic image of the Unimon. Uh, in, in practice, we realize it by the CPW that is uh, crowned at both ends, and we have a single Joseph's junction in the middle. So it's a very simple structure. It doesn't have any high kinetic inductance materials. It's just the normal materials you use to build up superconductive qubits anyways. Um, and it actually, it has a very high unharmonicity. Well, not very high, but let's say increased unharmonicity compared to the transmon even if it's a 50 ohm of CPW. I think we used 100 ohm CPW characteristic impedance in, in our experiments. Um, it's fully insensitive to low frequency charge noise because it has no superconducting islands. So it's really shunted to ground with just a superconducting wire. Um, and it's also insensitive to homogeneous flux noise. It's only, you know, it's only the flux difference through these two loops that actually bias it in a flux sense. 
this is the uh, lambda element model uh, and, and with this lambda element model we were actually able to come up with an exact mechanical analog of the Uniman which is like this twisting beam where there's a harmonic force, the twist, twisting, re restoring force of the twisting angle and then you have a mass. And this is actually an ex exact mechanical analog and the Uniman is, is the Uniman works so that uh, the, the sort of the, the, the mechanical, uh, the, the gravity force, the force due to gravity, uh, the harmonic force due to gravity cancels the harmonic force of this, of this beam that is twisting. And that's why it, you, it gives rise to this high unharmonicity uh, of the qubit. All right, so we made these Unimon chips. Uh, actually, the first Unimon we fabricated was the qubit C, oh, qubit B here on this plot. You can see that the unharmonicity is, is relatively high, hundreds of, uh, about the twice of the normal transmon unharmonicity. And, um, and that we get at the half flux quantum spot. That's where the sort of the mass is high up. That's, that's that point. Zero flux quantum is when the mass is down here. And, and there you get low unharmonicity. And we could model this uh, with quantum, quantum theory, quantum circuit theory, and you can see that the model fits quite well at both of these uh, spots, like zero flux quantum and half flux quantum. And so we understand, and we understand quite well this circuit. And we were able to do with the very, with the, with the qubit B, I think this is the qubit B result. So this was the very first Uniman we ever measured or you know, even tried to measure. And, uh, and we were able to get uh, three nines of gate fidelity uh, with 13 nanosecond pulses. And actually we could even, if we, even if, we, if we could had gone even to faster pulses, we could have got higher fidelity. And you can see that the fidelity is quite stable over time. So, so here you can see that we get this three nines of fidelity over eight hours with such a single calibration in the beginning. So we don't have to adjust any parameters, any fluxes for eight hours and we still get three nines of fidelity with the very first qubit we measured. So this is why we are quite excited about this and uh, we'll see how the next, next batch works out. Um, so about, about microwave, microwave source, um, this still we have not connected with the qubits, but we measured the source itself. Um, it, the source basically is a, is a, well, we current bias it, but because of this on-chip resistor, which is about one ohm, it, we actually voltage bias the Josephson junction. As you, and as you know, then when you voltage bias the Josephson junction, it's, you get oscillating current with the frequency given by the voltage. And then when it's coupled to this L, L, LC oscillator here, um, then you get the Saphiro steps. And basically when we work at the Saphiro step, we get a coherent wave out, uh, which is a well, classical coherent wave, sinusoidal uh, uh, voltage out. That's the idea. And, and this is some, some, just some images of the circuit. Um, and we were able to measure the power and, and the phase noise. And I, I just wanted to highlight that the phase noise we get uh, is, is quite low. So this is our, who is the LO and, and, and the rate is when we turn on the RF power. So we get about minus 100 dBc per hertz at 10 kilohertz offset, which is, which is good enough to do, you know, four nines of fidelity for single qubit gates. So um, that source at, as it is now, if we could just pulse it, could work as a nice. What about the second harmonics, third harmonics and so on? Oh yeah, um, that's good. I think we didn't measure them that carefully, um, but we think you don't get them that much because, um, because you know you lock into this this frequency. And actually, to get this low 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 phase noise, we did have an injection locking tone as well. So we we put a weak signal uh, on top of the bias current to lock the phase and and the and the frequency of the oscillator. This is like 100 times less power than we get out from the, from the device. Um, so that's okay. Um, all right, uh, but then this is just to a little bit compare what we achieved to do. So we got actually these tens of picowatts of output power at the low phase noise. And this is what you need for these high fidelity gates. The previous millikelvin sources had much less power. So this, they were not really practical, but of course we were not the first one to do this kind of source, but we were just able to do it with some better parameters basically, better performance. All right, so then I move on to the readout of, of superconducting qubits with the balometer. So I will spend maybe about 10 minutes here or so. Um, 
So as you know, nowadays qubits are read out typically by, uh, by putting a microwave tone to a readout resonator, which is dispersively coupled to the qubit. So the phase you get out depends then on the state of the qubit. And then you have a quantum linear amplifier, you amplify it, and then you measure in the end the voltage coming out uh, by, uh, by down converting with mixers, etc. cetera. Um, and this is great, this, this works very nice. You can get three nines of fidelity for readout, um, but, uh, and it's about, it's quite fast. You get about 100 nanosecond time scales there. But then you need, it's very bulky isolators here. And, and actually also the tupa, uh, that is a quantum limit amplifier, is quite large in size. So when you scale up to very high number of qubits, you would like to do something about it. You can't build a 10,000 qubit quantum computer or, or 100,000 qubit quantum computer with this technology. Um, so, okay. So this is, this is the typical dispersive readout. In the IQ plane, you get this kind of, blah, this kind of uh, sort of single shot experiments and average traces. So what, the, what I'm talking about here now is basically to replace this part, pulley this part, get rid of it, and just putting a 50 ohm resistor here at the end. And then we measure the electron temperature of the 50 ohm resistor. So this is an, uh, another way of measuring the qubits. I think nobody else has done it before. Uh, tell me if somebody has, we will cycle the paper. Um, so, and we use this multi-channel driving here instead of the normal driving, because in the multi-channel driving, we can, we can basically have the, um, the qubit ground state uh, um, scenario at almost zero power. And then when the qubit get, is in excited state, we can have high power coming out. So this, this is good for the uh, bolometric readout, because then you have low temperature here and high temperature here for the electrons. This is our, at least our plan uh, to do that. You get actually quite high power out uh, if you choose the parameters, right? There are some reasons, other reasons why you would like to use the bolometer, like the very low pump power compared to two pass and you know, naturally cold bath for the qubits. Um, you don't need the isolators uh, and a small footprint. Um, this slide, I just wanna say that we built a graphene bolometer recently. And uh, we read it out also using microwave reflection, but that is at half of gigahertz frequency. It, that frequency has almost nothing to do with the qubit frequency. It says we can choose it quite freely because we use this sort of temperature to frequency sort of uh, conversion, and that is very insensitive to the input frequency. So the input frequency of the bolometer is the qubit, is the qubit readout resonator frequency, and the readout frequency of the bolometer itself is completely independent of that. It's about half a gigahertz anyways. Um, but we measured very low nose excitement powers, like the lowest, uh, lowest anybody has measured for the bolometers or almost, almost on, on, on par of the lowest numbers. And then if you convert that to, that to energy resolution, you get about an energy resolution of 30 gigahertz times h bar, which is actually good enough for qubit readout because in the qubit readout, you have a, not a few photons at least coming out from your readout resonator. So you're not only, you don't only need to measure a single photon. All right, so what we did here is we have the bolometer here, we have the readout resonator, we have the qubit, and we can then excite the readout resonator. The, in, this, in this experiment, we did it continuously, and then, and then we can drive the qubit uh, or the readout resonator as well. Okay, actually in here, we kind of first measure the readout resonator with, with the bolometer. So this is the bolometer signal that we get out uh, after down conversion, and, and we, and we can, we can, you can see here that when we change the flux bias of the qubit, the resonator frequency also changes a bit. Um, and and this, is, this is basically just, you would do this normally with the VNA, but here we do it with the bolometer. Okay, just basic characterization. And then we also can e measure the qubit. So when the qubit uh, excitation frequency is in, in, is in resonance, we see a different signal in the, at the bolometer. So this is the qubit. And you can see the frequency is very different, uh, about two gigahertz different than the resonator frequency. Um, so we, this is the first time I think we have seen, or anybody has seen a qubit uh, with the bolometer. Um, might be wrong, maybe somebody did earlier, but we don't just know about it. But, uh, but we think it's the first time. Um, and then we went to measure traces after that. So basically here is like a 64 average trace uh, of the bolometer signal with all, all on or off resonance uh, excitation for the qubit. We can apply some filters then to, uh, to have better signal to noise ratio. And with this sort of uh, scheme, we were able to measure Rabi oscillations of the qubit. You can see quite many Rabi oscillations here, not much decay because the qubit uh, T1 was tens of microseconds. 
um, okay. This was the first time we measured Rabi oscillations, but then we went, then we started to do a little bit more careful analysis, uh, and and we measured now like the um, the barometer signal as a function of the readout resonator power and and the sort of the excitation, the pulse length to the readout resonator. And it turns out that with these, with these parameters, you need a few microseconds of, of readout uh, pulse. You, I think you can get it shorter if you just optimize the parameters, but, but this is what, with this sample. And, and then we choose now 10 microsecond pulse, uh, where we have a reasonable contrast in the image. Uh, and we then, the, the millivolts that I'm going to plot on the next slide is the average over, over this red part of the, of the pulse. So we average the voltage we get out in this part, and that's that's like what I plot on the y-axis here. So this is our new Rabi oscillation measurement. We got this just a few weeks ago. Sorry, there's something I don't understand. So you have a barometer, you're detecting the photons coming, uh, passing by your resonator, but the information is encoded in the phase of, of, of that signal. Oh. So how do you distinguish between the signals? No, 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 I, I just explained that it, you can also drive it so that it's in the amplitude. Okay. It depends on how you drive the resonator. Okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so this is the usual Chevron pattern uh, that you get. You can see that you know when you're on resonance, it's about here when you off resonance, the, the fringes get a little bit, a little bit faster. And, and it, there is only five, uh, 500 averages here. So this tells you about the signal to noise. The barometer actually is a, is a rather nice detector uh, for this. Um, you don't have any noise coming out of your amplifiers, right? So, um, so you don't need to average the amplifier noise. Um, and then we went to single shot experiments of the qubit, uh, and, and you can see here the single shot distributions. They are clearly offset. Uh, single to noise ratio is not very high, but still we could say that there's finite fidelity, finite single shot fidelity, but it's very low fidelity, but still there is finite one. But this, these experiments were actually done with the um, metallic barometer, which is not as sensitive as the graphene barometer. So just by moving to the graphene barometer here, we would get an order of magnitude, you know, less noise. I would, I would assume, uh, just by doing that, maybe even more than an order of magnitude less noise. So this kind of looks that the, the principle principle works. Uh, now it's about fine tuning and you know and, and moving into better better barometers then and better setups. Yep. I'm not sure I have understood if the 10 microsecond pulse is just for the conversion and and uh, having the photon in the barometer, or it's also for measuring the barometer signal? No, the barometer signal actually, we kind of take only this last part here, like the, the four microseconds in this case. Um, but, um, but it's basically that the you need enough power to go to the barometer <laughs> to have a, si a reasonable signal. And, and that's why we chose such a long, long, long pulse. But, but of course you can have more power by, by using you know, a resonator that has high, uh, higher kappa, basically a broader line width, but for example. We mitigate the barometer signal on how long? Also 10 microns? We, we basically measure it con almost, con we measure it from, for a long time, but then we only take the signal in this part. We only take this, basically we apply that kind of a filter that we just take, take this part of the signal and we do a time average there. And that's what you sh see here basically on, on, this, on this scale or on this, on, on the, or this scale. But that's just one way of doing it. You could do it differently, but we, we just did it now this way. So, Miko, uh, do you need to wait for the barometer to reset? Uh, we, yeah, yeah, the barometer, also the metallic barometer has a relatively long thermal time constant. And we, if we turn off the power, then the probe power, then it resets. Uh, I don't now remember exactly. I mean, it depends on the operation point also, what is the thermal time constant, but yes, it is. Uh, much higher than 10 microseconds, uh, it might be 100 microseconds or even a millisecond scale, depends on the parameters. But, but then the, the, the graphene barometer is nice in the sense that it had only like 200 nanosecond times time constant. So, so that is kind of then more feasible maybe for the qubit readout in, in terms of scaling up or using it for, for a good readout. But this is basically what I'm now say, trying to say here is that we have tested the principle that it works, and it actually we were surprised that with this metallic barometer it even works this well. All right, um, so now I have about 10 minutes time left. I'm going to talk about now the reset uh, of, of qubits with the quantum circuit refrigerator. 
and uh, just just to say that we did try two different approaches, like a like a tunable feel, uh, tunable basically resonator with the resistor in it. Um, there are some experiments also on the, on that how to reset resonators. We didn't have qubits there, but then now I'm going to focus on the quantum circuit refrigerator, which is basically this SI and tunnel junctions that we voltage bias, and when we turn on the bias, you turn on the dissipation. Uh, and there is also a paper where that kind of combined these two, and we studied exceptional points in the, in that. And uh, there's some latest theory papers on the on the QCR here in collaboration with Gianluigi. Uh, and, uh, and the latest experiments are in this paper. Uh, I will also say a few words about those latest experiments. But this is the principle, like that when we turn on the, so, so you have the SI and NIS junction, junctions here, so you voltage bias them, and then you have a quantum device that is coupled basically to this island here in this case. There are different scenarios, I mean different ways you can couple, but this is like the, now the, the simplest thing that we did first. Or maybe it's not the simplest, but that's what we did first. Um, and when you voltage bias it, um, then the photon ascent tunneling can start to take place. And, and when your bias is less than the gap, uh, kind of the absorption of photons from your quantum device, that is this one, is preferred over the emission. Um, and this is kind of the phenomenon we use. It's been known for a long time. And as you saw, the, previ the previous talk, the first talk of today was using SIS junctions and photon assistant tunneling there. And there's been a lot of work on those as well. Um, but this is kind of what we did. We, we did it with SIS junctions in these experiments. Um, so the device basically looks like this, uh, that you have a resonator here and you have the QCR at the end and we measure reflection. And this is just a normal re reflection data. You get the phase and the amplitude. And from those phases and amplitudes, with, with, uh, with the, as function of bias voltage, we can basically extract what is the dissipation rate that the QCR induces on the uh, resonator and what is the frequency shift of the resonator due to the QCR. And um, there's two different samples here, and you can see that we can quite nicely um, reproduce the theoretical prediction uh, for those with very few fitting parameters. Uh, and, um, and also the frequency shift we can explain quite well with the lamp shift uh, given, given uh, from, from the theory. So, so and, and basically now we are mostly interested at this, like in, when you do qubit reset, like what is the on-off ratio? And you can see that it's uh, maybe three, three or three and a half orders of magnitude or so in this case. So that's like, you can tune basically T1 of the qubit by that, that order of magnitude, if, if everything works like you want them to work. Um, we did this kind of ex experiment with still like using a pulsed, uh, pulsed QCR on a, sensor, on a resonator. And, and here you can see the resonator, we first excite the resonator with a coherent tone, and then we let it, let it to ring down. Uh, and then during this ring down, we turn on the QCR for a very short period of time. Uh, we basically apply a voltage pulse here, and then we can see that the signal drops uh, very quickly. And, and this was kind of the first demonstration that, okay, you can also turn it on and off in a reasonable time scale uh, if you think about qubit reset, uh, not just in the previous experiments where you're just applying a DC voltage on the QCR. Okay. Um, and now, we, then we moved on into, into resetting qubits. Uh, so here you can see a qubit, that the qubit is now capacitively coupled to the QCR, which is actually just right there, it's so small you can't really see it. There's an on-chip uh, low-pass filter as well. And, uh, and basically this is the circuit scheme, so you apply the voltage here, and then the current passes through this loop, and, and, and the qubit island is now capacitively coupled to the QCR island, as I showed you in the very beginning. Um, and, and what we do is that we can excite the qubit with a pi pulse in the very beginning. Uh, firstly, of course, wait that the qubit is going to be reset by itself. Uh, and then we drive it with a pi pulse to the excited state. We apply a voltage pulse to the QCR with a variable length. And then uh, we measure the qubit population. And as you can see here, uh, the, the end result, the excited state probability as a function of the QCR pulse length uh, decays at, with the low amplitudes, it decays exponentially, and the exponential decay constant goes down, uh, or the exponential decay gets faster when we increase the amplitude of the QCR. Uh, 
then we can see something that is a little bit funny. You know, it's, it's not, when we go to higher amplitudes, it's not purely exponential anymore. There's like more to it. And we think we understand at least partly why, why this is. It's because uh, it turns out that these uh, junctions are actually quite resistive because there's this the superconducting gap and, it, and this, this capacitance value is relatively large in comparison so that you get a kind of a slow RC uh, it, sort of charging up of the island. And I think that's why we at least could see two time constants. And, and we're kind of in the middle of, uh, you know, working this out in a more de detailed way. And, and I think we can get it working. It's, a, it's just something that we didn't think about first uh, when we started to do these experiments that, okay, there's this charging up of the island that actually matters uh, as well. Um, yep, but anyways, this is again the kind of the demonstration that the QCR can be used to reset qubits uh, with the variable decay time. And I think this opens up a nice toolbox for more experiments whether you want to do like this environment assisted entangled state or dissipation engineering or whatever, I mean, uh, you have this kind of toolbox soon uh, that you can, you can then apply with qubits as well. Um, I'm almost done. Um, I could say still a few words about the RFQCR that we published very recently. So those previous ones, we only applied like a DC voltage to bias it or, or pulsed voltage to bias it. But in this case, we actually um, use a second mode of the resonator and we drive that second mode of the resonator to induce this multi-photon assistant tunneling processes. So when you apply power to the second mode of the resonator, you can turn on and off the QCR also by that RF power. And, and this might be nicer in some, some cases where you don't want to apply like the fast DC pulses, but instead you want to quickly pulse RF, uh, which might be simpler from a practical point of view uh, in some scenarios. Um, so here is now again the dissipation rate uh, as function of the now the DC bias voltage uh, at different uh, RF powers. Um, and yeah, this data is, is uh, there, yeah. Um, you can clearly see that uh, actually even at zero bias voltage, if we apply enough power, we can, we can, in, we can uh, you know, make the dissipation rate higher. And then you can see also these sort of bumps and humps, and they, they are due to the multi-photon processes, actually. And we can also now plot the, uh, the, the frequency shift of the resonator, and you can see that that also then has these bumps. And the theory we have here, uh, we have only a few fitting parameters for the whole data. So for all different powers, for all different uh, voltages, we use the same, same sort of parameter values. So you can see that even though the fit is not perfect, it, you know, it does explain many things that is going on in the, in, the, in the sample. All right, so I think I'm pretty much done here. Uh, and just to recap that, you know, what I talked about, um, and, you know, if you have any further questions, I'm still happy to answer them. So, yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Exciting stuff. So we have, uh, we have several questions. Uh, what about the back, back action of this um, bolometer readout? We drop the isolators and uh, the usual measurement chain. So did you evaluate that? Yeah. So that's the nice thing about that. I think that is nice thing about it that basically the bolometer input is a very cold resistor. So that's exactly what you want, right? So that's the, that's the back action that you will have, the back action of a very cold resistor. But it's a fully uh, destructive uh, readout. Uh, you always get zero at the end for the qubit, whether it was in zero or was it, whether it was in the one state. No, 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 no. See, we don't measure the qubit in this case directly. We don't measure the excitation from the qubit directly. But what we measure is we measure the signal coming out of the readout resonator. It's dispersively coupled to the qubit. So you don't con convert the qubit photon into a a, a photon in the bolometer. It's just a signal coming from for the resonator. Y y yeah, yeah. It's still dispersive readout. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, to 
there was also a question in the back, but is, is it related then the discussion? No, no? Okay, then I will, I will come back to it. Yeah, I, I will come back to it. <laughs> Uh, about your bolometer, so this um, time resolution that you mentioned, 200 nanoseconds, what is it determined by? Uh, what, is it electron phonon coupling or some capizza resistance? Do you have any idea? Well, uh, first of all, it's not a time resolution. The time resolution is set by your electrical circuit. That, that it is much faster than the thermal time constant of the bolometer. The ther thermal time constant of the bolometer that was in the graphene case down to 200 nanoseconds Yes, that is, uh, that is determined by the heat capacity of the graphene uh, electron excitations and then the thermal conduction to outside world. And um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. We, um, sometimes, sometimes, yeah, I mean, it might, yeah, I, we have in the paper more details. Uh, um, as far as I remember, it can Electron phonon can actually be, be there also a significant contribution because in graphene the power is not to the fifth like in the metals, but it's it's, it's slower power and then if, when you cool it down it actually ha can have a larger contribution relatively speaking than the photon coupling. But certainly the photon photon thermal conduction also is 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 non negligible I think in that uh, experiment as well. Um, but yeah, this is something that yeah. Um, can be also studied, studied in more detail, like what is exactly limiting it. It's again a, a question about the bolometer. You nicely explained the motivation as uh, getting rid of the circulators and the Hamilton amplifiers, so you have something way more compact and, and scalable, which is, I think, super cool. But then on the circuit diagram, you showed you were using a circulator to read out the bolometer, so I guess Probably a dumb question. I, I, I guess yeah, yeah, I, there is something I, I missed, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that is exactly right. In that experiment, we did use an isolator, and sometimes we even use a JPA uh, to to boost the bolometer signal. You get about a factor of two, by the way, only with the JPA. You don't get order of magnitude improvement. Um, however, actually, in the quite first experiments we did, we didn't use an isolator. We just used a resistive splitter, and uh, so you basically lose some of the bolometer signal, but the thing is that if your signal to noise is already good enough, that cuts, comes out of the bolometer, it doesn't matter. I mean, because the bolometer itself is also amplifying in a way the signal, and it, it, you know, with an improved design, I'm pretty sure we can do it such that then it doesn't matter. Then you don't have to use actually this isolator anymore. I just wonder, did you, for the bolometer readout, did you try or consider using kind of a James Cumming nonlinear readout? So, I mean, this thing Yale did many years ago of just put it, you know, if I put in enough power into the readout resonator, it bifurcates by itself, right? Which gives you much more readout power. We, uh, we did not do it, no. Uh, we, 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 I had the study, I mean, we went to this higher power regime with this one microsecond pulse length but we were not yet smart enough to kind of employ that sort of bifurcation nonlinearity to our advantage. I think this is another thing that you, one, could, one could certainly try. So I would have a very quick question about your uh, qubit. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, but it's a, it's a flux qubit, right? I mean, it's basically a flux qubit. Or, or if it's not, what is the difference to a flux qubit? <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, it, some people say it's a transmon, some people say it's a flux qubit, some people say it's a fluxonium. Um, so the, um, yeah, the, the kind of the, the charging energy is very close to that of a transmon in, in the one that we made. But on the other hand, um, and it has a single junction, like, like a transmon, but then it's shunted with an inductor to ground, inductively shunted. So in a way, it kind of looks like a fluxonium then, because you have an inductive shunt. Well, um, like, like an inductively shunted transmon, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah or, or inductively shunted but, yeah. so the, but the point is that, um, that um, it has like, it kind of, what we tried to do is to combine these sort of properties that you would like your qubit to have. Like insensitive to charge noise fully, okay, you put an inductive shunt, 
You have only a single junction, it's very simple. There's no islands whatsoever that can charge up. Uh, and, and then you want to have high anharmonicity with the standard fabrication tools and materials that you have in your fab. And when we put all that together, we get the unimon. It's not like one thing, but it's kind of, it's like the combination of everything. And then it turns out that um, actually in this parameter range you, of the fluxonium circuit, yeah, you got one of the E, L and E, J have to be equal, or they're, they're close to equal to have this cancellation effect that I talked about. And it turns out that almost nobody else has gone with that parameter point. I think it was just in Johannes Fink's group, they actually have quite close, there's a cl close, close shot. Uh, of course, the parameters, the, and the, the circuit was completely different than what he used, but, uh, but it turns out that that is kind of a parameter point that might be very good. So, the, so you always need to make compromises when you tune the parameters. Sometimes, you know, you get, you know, you know how it is. Uh, so, or the, was it actually in your group? No, no, it was Fink's, uh, Fink's group, yeah. 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 All right, so I think we will have plenty of... Oh. I think we oh, all yeah, want to know uh, that. Sorry, so yeah, I, I, to I, go to <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah, so as you saw, like we got, we got three nines of single qubit gate fidelity with 30 nanosecond pulses, so you can work out what is a T2, it's about 10 microseconds uh, in that case. Um, you know, there's a factor of 1,000 uh, difference between the gate length and the T2. Um, and we don't really know why it's so short, because um, the fab fabrication recipe and, and people and everything used to make the Unimon qubit typically gives you 50 microseconds of T1. And in this case, actually, the T1 was like 10 microseconds or even a bit lower, depends on which qubit. The numbers are in the archive paper. And yeah, I, I mean, I don't know whether it was just a bad batch or whether there is something more to it. And, and we have to, and most likely with the design, we can get around many things. And so there's a chance that if we improve now the T1 still to 50 or 100 microseconds and the T1, T2 as well, um, we can get four nines. We don't, don't even need to go that far to get four nines actually. Um, but of course the, the, the real thing is then to show four nines for the two qubit gates. I mean, that's what we wanna do. Now three nines is the, is the record in superconducting qubits and we wanna go to four. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs> so we will resume at two o'clock.